Hi everybody. As recently as the 1980s, Renaissance art history showed relatively little interest in feminist theory. In a famous 1977 essay, Joan Kelly had urged fellow historians to recover and document female experiences during the Renaissance, and she argued that gender was an important lens through which the period could be seen. And yet, most scholarship simply continued to accept maleness as an unstated norm, and thus tacitly perpetuated the position of Jacob Burckhardt in his influential 1860 book that men and women had largely similar experiences. From our point of view, of course, such a claim now seems patently naive. Of course, Renaissance women experienced their world differently than their male contemporaries in what was a heavily gendered society. Over those past few decades, scholars have documented those differences with increasing nuance. But one of the most important early examples of such scholarship was a 1992 study by Patricia Simons. Originally drafted as a paper in 1987, Simon's article focused on the roughly 40 surviving profile portraits of women painted in Florence between 1440 and 1470. Now, as she notes, the earliest profile portraits produced in the second quarter of the 1400s actually uh, focused on male subjects, and they were related in form to the medals that were being produced by Pisanello and others. They advertised the alleged virtu, or virile qualities and virtues of the subject. Military gear was common, as were strong features, bold forms, and ruddy skin. Such works seem to have been intended to convey a rugged masculinity. But by the 1440s, men were more often depicted in active three-quarters poses or sculpted busts. They actively occupied space. Images of women, by contrast, were very different. They still employed the conservative profile view and emphasized features widely associated with female beauty at the time, such as high hairlines, blonde hair, and pale skin, and they often depicted their sitters in rich fabrics and expensive jewelry. But these weren't simply sitters putting on their best outfit for the day. Rather, as Simon showed, the women were shown wearing the very sorts of outfits that they would have worn when they were getting married. At that moment, in other words, when they were paraded publicly through the city to begin their new lives in their groom's family household. They were, in a sense, now the property of their husband, a notion that's conveyed through specific details, such as the L visible here on the shoulder of Giovanna Tornaboni, that's the first letter of her husband Leonardo's name, or the triangular emblem of his family that recurs on her sleeve. Viewed in this context, the use of the profile view is notable. Women at the time were instructed to avoid making eye contact. Truly modest and chaste women, it was argued, averted their gaze. These painted women seemed to obey that stricture and to embody pious, wifely behavior. Or, as Simons puts it, the profile, presenting an averted eye and a face available to scrutiny, was suited to the representation of an ordered, chaste, and decorous piece of property. But who exactly was scrutinizing? Well, as Simons points out, these images were inevitably funded by men, painted by men, and likely intended for men. And here she drew on a concept that had been popularized by the film scholar Laura Mulvey. In 1975, Mulvey had argued that the vast majority of Western films were organized for the pleasure of the male gaze. That is, they offered a series of passive female objects to implicitly male viewers, associating maleness with a dominant active position and femaleness with the state of being looked at. That concept was soon embraced by other theorists and by many contemporary artists, such as Barbara Kruger, who openly invoked the concept of the gaze in her work in the 1980s. And Simons, in turn, applied Mulvey's terms to Quattrocento profile portraits, concluding that, quote, to be a woman in the world was and is to be the object of the male gaze, unquote. Importantly, though, the paintings did not merely idealize their subjects. They also acted as implicit guides to any females in the household. The female subjects are often shown as elaborately framed. They're remote from the world, uh, through which, of course, they could rarely move without a chaperone. And they're sealed into niches, precious treasures, really, as much as living beings. Indeed, you could say that they're not even full three-dimensional individuals. Instead, they're often flattened and their thin, elegant necks suggest vulnerability more than a capacity for action. These are spectacles or abstract symbols of social ideals rather than realistic portraits. And importantly, even women of the time seem to have internalized some of the ideologies 
implicit in these works. In 1467, Lucrezia Tornabuoni traveled to Rome to examine a potential bride for her son, Lorenzo de' Medici. Her report, which she rendered in a letter, was ruthless. Clarice was of good height and has a nice complexion. Her manners are gentle, but not so winning as those of our girls. Her throat is fairly elegant, but it seems to me a little meager, and so on. The young woman was effectively being anatomized or pinned to the wall like a butterfly. And that, concludes Simons, was the ultimate purpose of the profile portraits as well. Turned away from the viewer, the painted women never confront the male gaze, rather they give themselves up to it. Or in Simon's words, the averted eye and face open to scrutiny, necessarily presented by the profile view, permit the close, cool, and extended exposure of the body reported in 15th century letters and poems. In the process, the images facilitated a sort of depersonalized exchange in which female bodies functioned as a form of social currency, which was ultimately controlled by men. By the late 1400s, the profile portraits gave way to other forms of representation, although we can still see echoes of it in later works, such as Leonardo's depiction of Isabella d'Este. For a time, though, the portraits constituted a popular idiom, and they act as an important reminder that Renaissance art was never simply a naturalistic reflection of reality, but rather a series of gender-based constructions through which power was advertised and exercised. Of course, from our point of view, this can seem obvious, and we're used to artists and theorists calling our attention to the male gaze and to the violence that it can perpetrate. Scholars have shown us, too, that we can also speak meaningfully of the female gaze, or even the queer gaze, perspectives that have been explored in some detail by Renaissance art historians in recent years. Nevertheless, Patricia Simon's 1992 essay remains an important step in the creation of a meaningfully feminist, and therefore more dimensional and more inclusive, art history.